How close are the Jets to having a good defense? What does Zach Wilson need to do to make 2022 a success? What about the backup quarterback situation? We'll discuss all of these topics and more on today's mailbag edition of the Locked On Jets podcast. You are Locked On Jets, your daily New York Jets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome. This is the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's Wednesday, May 25th, 2022, and I'm your host, John B. from GangGreenNation.com. A big shout out to subscribers to this podcast, and if you want to join that group, just hit the subscribe button wherever you're watching or listening. You'll never miss an episode. And if you happen to be watching on YouTube, please give this episode a big thumbs up. Helps the channel out, and it helps other Jets fans find the podcast. Well, today we have our weekly mailbag. Each week we try to do a Wednesday mailbag edition. Occasionally there's something scheduling-wise which forces us to change that, but most weeks we do it on Wednesday. Thanks to everybody who sent in questions. And we begin with a question on the Jets' defense. Is this defense one or two players away from being very good? Well, it depends on your definition of very good. Yesterday, I talked about some of the moves the Jets made in the offseason and the philosophies that they may show from Robert Sala and Joe Douglas. So you can check that episode out if you haven't heard it already. But one thing that kind of stuck out to me is last year... In 2021, the focus was all about building the defensive line. And that's, you know, they went in, they made some big moves, getting Carl Lawson. They made some smaller moves like Sheldon Rankins, very minor move in Vinnie Curry. And the returns were very mixed on, on these moves. And, you know, there were injuries that really kind of impacted things up front. But the focus was on the defensive line. This year, it kind of seemed like they turned their attention to the next most important position, which is corner, when they go out and get DJ Reed. And, and then they draft Sauce Gardner fourth overall but they're still trying to improve that defensive line because it's still the the most important spot. And in most NFL defenses, not all, but most NFL defenses, your top two areas of importance are defensive line and corner in some order. You know, some teams will place a bigger emphasis on corner than defensive line. Others will be more focused on defensive line than corner, but in almost all defenses, those are the two most important positions. You can, I mean, you can design a scheme where linebackers, take on a bigger role, which is actually what I think the Jets kind of were doing last year. You know, where they, essentially, the Jets were trying to... Uh, you saw the, What you saw the Jets do a lot last year was ask their corners to only defend the deep third or deep quarter of the field, and that essentially leaves a lot of room open underneath, so you need fast linebackers to be able to cover that ground. And there are teams that... that and sometimes a safety will come into the mix as well. You know, you'll play safety closer to the line of scrimmage, and he'll help out with that. And there are teams that run schemes like that, you know, um, actually, you know, Carolina did that when Luke Keekley was there. But for most teams, the, the two biggest areas of emphasis are going to be defensive line and corner. And it's almost like the Jets are kind of like prioritizing these areas as they build. Like, first, we're going to get the most important area, which to us is defensive line. Then we're going to move on to corner. And they haven't really addressed the other areas yet. You know, they haven't addressed linebacker yet. They haven't really addressed. I mean, they've brought in Quincy Williams. And they haven't really addressed safety. I know they, they signed Whitehead, but those are two areas that are probably the two weakest areas on your defense. And as, I, as I've said many times in the weeks since the draft, if I'm going to be good on defense, I want to be good on defensive line. And if you can only give me two areas where I'm going to be good, those are the two areas I want to be good. And I have, if I have to be weak somewhere, you know, safety and linebacker are probably the areas you're going to choose. Maybe not deep safety. You know, you don't want a deep safety like Ashton Davis who's always running himself out of the play and, allowing you know nor- moderate gains to turn into 30 yard gains but if you have credible play at safety that's usually enough and that goes back you know we've we had that debate for years when Jamal Adams was here how much of a difference does a premium safety make over just a credible safety in today's NFL it's not that hard to find credible linebacker play it may not be easy to find great linebacker play but it's not hard to find credible linebacker play and it's not that hard to find credible safety play so you know as I watch the Jets and I think about how they're going to build this team going forward. I feel like they, they're trying to address, they're, they're kind of trying to go in order. They're trying to first address the premium positions. And then after they feel like they're, they've got a solid footing there, then maybe they can move on to the other spots. And I think, I feel like this defensive line, you know, they're still missing a couple pieces. 
I'm still not sure there's there's like that premium premium pass. Now maybe Jermaine Johnson develops into that, but I'm not sure there's like that guy who's just like you know, the guy who keeps you up at night. Carl Lawson's going to be a very good pass rusher for the Jets, I think, if he bounces back from injury. Jermaine Johnson has a lot of potential. You got good players, Quinn and Williams, John Franklin Myers. Um, so it's, they're good players on the defensive line. I'm not sure there's a great player on the defensive line. Another area which is kind of like a quiet concern is there's not really a run-stopping defensive tackle on this team anymore now that Foley Fatakasi is gone. And Foley Fatakasi's regression left. He was not as good in 2021 as he was in 20 or he was in 19. But that's a concern given the run defense. So that that's an issue. And then linebacker and, and safety. So, I mean, it depends on your definition of very good. This defense should be improved because they should, they should be much better against the pass. Between the pass rushers that they're adding, and Carl Lawson's part of that mix, if we're talking about pass rushers they're adding because he wasn't here last year, they should be better against the pass. The run, you know, you hope they're better. You hope Quinton and Williams bounces back. Quinton and Williams did not have a great year. last. Quinton and Williams regressed against the run last year. You hope that these guys play better. Jermaine Johnson should be, you know, he's a solid run defender. John Franklin Myers as an end, maybe not so much as a tackle, but as an end is a solid run defender. C.J. Mosley has his moments. You hope Quincy Williams develops a bit. You hope they get better play. I mean, safety play actually was really, I was really surprised when I looked this up, but safety play really hurt the run defense last year because, I mean, there were like five 30-yard runs that Ashton Davis missed that he should have made a tackle on that could have, it could have kept those gains as more moderate instead of turning into 30-yard uh, runs. So there are still some pieces to add. I, I think that they're not quite there yet. I, I'm not sure. It may be three or four players. It may not be one or two, because there's still some issues in these areas that I've mentioned. But we're getting there. We're moving in the right direction. You know, you're either moving in the right direction or you're moving in the wrong direction. And I do think the Jets are moving in the right direction on the defensive side of the ball. Next question. Jets have done a lot to help Zach Wilson. What would it take for you to be worried about Zach's ability to become at least an average NFL starting quarterback? Let's say as good as Kirk Cousins or Derek Carr. Well, you know something? This is an interesting... I'm going to make an interesting point, a point that I find interesting here is that I think the perception is that this pick would be a failure if Zach Wilson turned into Kirk Cousins or Derek Carr. It really would not be. Zach Wilson would actually be a very successful pick for the Jets if he turned into that kind of quarterback. And I, I've mentioned this last week. I feel like we underestimate the value of a quality quarterback in this league. I think we, we always want to, we, you know, and it's understandable because especially picking second overall, you have dreams of a guy who's going to, you know, challenge for MVPs. He's guy's going to be the, you know, all pro. He'll be able to lift the team up every week. You know, he'll, he'll be able to make it all happen. It's not necessarily the most real, even at second overall, if you look at the history of quarterbacks drafted two overall, it's not that great. I mean, it's it's really not that great. In fact, I remember last year I, I looked this up, and this was I don't think this was quarterbacks. I think this was all players drafted second overall over a certain time frame, and like the median player was kind of Marcus Mariota, who obviously is you know kind of like a borderline starter, high quality backup. So even though you're sitting there second overall, you think you you got a guaranteed shot at getting a star quarterback, you really don't. So I think like that's actually a very success, especially like given what we saw last year from Zach. I think like that him turning into like that kind of quarterback where you can win with him if you right, put the right pieces around him, where he's going to give you quality. I think that would be a very good outcome for the Jets. I mean, look through the years. I mean, look, how many how many times have we watched a guy who couldn't play at all? I keep hearing this this philosophy, and in the past I used to share it that well, it's better to have a guy who's you know better to have a complete bust so you can move on than a guy who's just uh, just okay. That's not. I, I don't agree. I used to think that. I don't think that anymore. Because a quality, you know, if you have a quality quarterback, a Cousins or a Car type, you can win. It gives you an opportunity, and you know, trying to find that guy out there, you know, trying to find that once in a generation talent, it's really tough to do. So I, I think that it would be a really good outcome for the Jets. So the question though was not that. The question was, what would it make you? What would what would it take for you to be worried about Zach's ability to become at least an average NFL starting quarterback? Honestly, I think it would be if he doesn't look like one this year because I think the Jets have put decent pieces around him. I think the Jets are going to be able to take a lot off his plate. They're going to look to establish the run. This is going to be a run-first offense. They're going to try and keep him out of bad situations. And, I mean, last year, you know, I've talked about the numbers, but it's not so. It's more what the numbers represent. I mean, if you if you look at the eye test last year, there were many points where Zach Wilson just did not pass it. And what, what I mean by that is, 
did not look like he was in command of the offense. He did not look comfortable going through his progressions. I feel like this year is important because on some level you can understand like why a rookie quarterback, especially one coming out of BYU, a small program, it's not necessarily the most shocking thing in the world. It was disappointing, but it's not necessarily the most shocking thing in the world that a quarterback in that situation would struggle a little bit out the gate. But now he's got a full offseason under his belt. You know, we're hearing all the talks about how he's bulked up, whatever that means, you know, whatever that means for his quarterback, for the quality of his quarterback play. Um, but he's got he's got a full season on with he's got a full season to learn the playbook, to get comfortable with his group of receivers. Now Garrett Wilson's coming in and a couple tight ends, but he's got a full season to get comfortable with Elijah Moore, Corey Davis, even though Corey Davis missed, you know, half the season. He's had a lot of time to develop with those two receivers. So I want him to look like a credible quarterback this year. I, I feel like this year he's got to look like he's got to. And the game I looked back to for hope, well, I mean, there, the game I looked back to for hope as far as Zach, like having a high ceiling would be Tennessee because he made all those plays. The game I looked to for hope for him being a credible, a quality quarterback in this league is Tampa Bay because, you know, was Zach Wilson spectacular in that game? Did he look like a su- superstar in the main? No, he did not. But he looked like a quality quarterback. He looked like a guy who could stick that back foot in the ground, make his reads decisively, know what he was doing, be authoritative with the football. That's what I'm looking for, especially in year two. I'm never going to ho- – I mean, I'm past the point where I'm hoping any quarterback's going to be special, but I'm hoping Zach Wilson could turn into a quality quarterback. And that was the game – that was to me like was the one game from start to fit. There were games where he did it for like a half. There were games where he did it for a quarter. That was the game where I really felt like from start to finish Tampa Bay – where he looked like he was comfortable in the offense. He looked like he would knew what he was doing. And he did it with a group of receivers that frankly was not NFL caliber. So I, I really want, I, it's difficult to say as a, a statistical measure. It's difficult to say it's, it, it's difficult to quantify. It's one of those things where you, you know it when you see it. And I want him to look like an, if he doesn't look like an, a guy who's in, who's in complete command of the offense, who can go through his reads authoritatively, be decisive with the football and make the right read by this year, I'm concerned. I'm not asking for, for him to be Patrick Mahomes. I'm asking for him to look like a quality quarterback this year. Now, head on the Locked On Jets podcast. We'll continue to talk about the quarterback, but we'll talk about the backup quarterback situation for the Jets. Who will the backup be? Can they run the offense? I'll tell you what I think ahead here on this Wednesday mailbag episode. We're about to talk about the Jets' backup quarterback situation, but if you want a little bit of back, backup for your health, you should check out Athletic Greens 1. With one, delicious, with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and aptogens to help start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovering, recovery, focus, and aging. All the things. Tons of people take some kind of multivitamin, and it's important to choose one with high-quality ingredients that your body will actually absorb. AG1 is a small microhabit with big benefits. It's the one thing you can do every single day to take care of yourself. And a subscription comes with a year supply of vitamin D, which is so important to add in the, during those winter months when you don't get as much side, uh, sunlight. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NFL Network. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash NFL Network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Thank you so much for making Locked On Jets your first listen every day. And for your next listen, check out the Locked On Sports Today Today podcast. The biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. Available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. Today we are doing our weekly mailbag show. Our next question is about Zach Wilson's backups. Do you think Mike White or Joe Flacco would be next in line if Wilson got hurt or struggled? With the talent the Jets have on offense, do you think either could provide credible play? I'm guessing it's Flacco. I mean, I just don't see why you'd bring Flacco back to be the number three quarterback. Is a mentor really that important? So the whole thing is like the, the theory behind Flacco is like Zach Wilson needs a mentor. That's great. But a year ago, the Jets were telling us Zach Wilson didn't need a veteran mentor. So, you know, what's going on there? I mean, I think the fact they, I, I think the Jets kind of gave you a tell last year. What was the first thing they did when Zach Wilson went down? They traded for Flacco. And that's telling because Mike White was about to step into the starting job. 
so the fact that they traded for Flacco, that kind of suggests to me that they don't have a lot of faith in Mike White. There's a second clue here. After that Buffalo game, Jets played Miami. Zach Wilson still wasn't ready to start. They put Flacco in the starting lineup. This was after Flacco had had a few weeks to get acclimated to the playbook. Mike White, I mean, Mike White was not good against Buffalo, but there was really nothing at that point that suggested to me he should be heading to the bench instead of Flacco. So I think it just shows you that Flacco is the guy they have more belief in. And I mean, we see this from time to time with Joe Douglas, and we see it from time to time with a lot of GMs. Sometimes they just really like a player early in their career, and they let that cloud their judgment. Joe Fla- uh, Joe Douglas famously scouted Flacco when Douglas was with the Ravens. Uh, Flacco was a prospect coming out of Delaware. And I feel like that's one of those things that's kind of clouding Joe Douglas's judgment. I, I mean, I-, I don't think Flacco can run the offense effectively. The one thing I'll say for Flacco is I do have like this belief when a guy used to be good, there's usual, there's always like one last great game lurking somewhere. So, I, I mean, Flacco can't do it for a month. He can't do it for two months. He can't do it for the full season. There might be one last great game in there for Flacco. I actually remember years and years ago, I read this article by Peter King. And it was about 10 years after John Elway retired. And Elway said, Elway told Peter King essentially that if I needed to go in, I could win a game today, 10 years after I retired. But I can't, but I wouldn't be able to win one the next week because it'd just, it'd just be too much for my body to absorb. As Flacco ages, I mean, I don't. I, maybe he could be, maybe he can get you through one game. I don't know that he could do more. Can Mike White succeed? Can Mike White run this offense functionally? Well, we saw him do it. I mean, we did see him do it against the Bengals. I mean, I think the Jets caught the Bengals by surprise by that week, and the Bengals' game plan did not make a whole lot of. I mean, the Bengals pretty much let Mike White do whatever he wanted in that game. But I think of the two, Mike White's the guy I prefer. Because we've seen Mike White do it. We've seen Mike White give you a credible play. Can he do it over a consistent basis? I don't know, but I would go with Mike White. I feel like Mike White's earned the shot to be the backup quarterback. But what do I know? Uh, Jets certainly, I don't think the Jets are going to agree with me. I think Flacco is going to be the guy, but I personally would prefer that. Our next question. Joe Douglas's drafts year one and year two. Who were your favorite picks those years and how did they turn out? Who was a good surprise? Well, I, I hate to say it, but year one, I think my favorite pick was Denzel Mims. Uh, how did that turn out? Not good. Not good. I'd love to tell you Bryce. I really did like the Bryce Hall pick in the fifth round, but uh, my favorite pick was Denzel Mims, and that did not turn out very well. As far as year two goes, I think I would say Elijah Moore, and I'm very, I'm still high on Elijah Moore. I think Elijah Moore is going to be really good if he can stay on the field. I, I have a lot of belief in Elijah Moore, so... That would be, you know, that that would probably be the the pick I'd say year two. Um, who was a good surprise in those two years? Uh, I don't know if Bryce Hall would be would be a contender. I mean, Michael Carter I was expecting to be pretty good. Maybe Michael Carter the second. I think Michael Carter the second is actually more solid than people give him credit for being. So maybe Mike, you know, Mike, the fact that Michael Carter the second was able to step in as a rookie. He wasn't the greatest slot corner in the league, but I think in context he, he was pretty good. So I think that's that's the direction I would go in. As and JD draft year three, who's your favorite pick and why? I'll, I'll tell you, it's Brees Hall. I think he's going to step in and be great right away. And you know, I've been wrong on these things before, so take it for what it's worth. But I think he's exactly what the Jets needed on offense. I think if you want to take pressure off Zach Wilson, there there were one of two ways you could do it. You could either go out and get a big time receiver this off season, or you could supplement the run game and they've really supplemented the run game i love the fit here i think he's a great fit for the wide zone scheme i think that making michael carter michael carter is now the number two back you have a number two back with number one back skills so Brees hall it, that's my pick that's my pick Brees hall I, I and i am i i've i've uh crowned myself the king of being opposed to trading up for a running back in the second round and i like this pick so that should tell you a lot about the quality of this pick at least as far as what I think, because I think I, this is the pick. This is the guy. Like I'm very confident of. I think all four of these guys who were picked early have a shot to be very good. But the one I have the most confidence is in is Brees Hall. I think he's going to change this offense completely. I, I think you're going to see a uh, Jets are going to be able to run the ball this year when they want to run the ball. It's going to be it's going to be unlike any Jets offense we've seen in recent years. Now head here on the Lockdown Jets podcast. We will close out our weekly mailbag. We'll talk about. 
whether Robert Sala has a plan in place to possibly replace coaches who move on to greener pastures. That's as we move ahead here on this Wednesday mailbag episode. Well, of course, it's the NFL offseason, but believe it or not, you can still bet on the NFL. Bet Online has NFL futures. If you believe Joe Douglas had a great offseason, you can put some money down, make some good money when the Jets succeed this year. And Bet Online continues to be the number one source for all of your sports betting needs and sports info. That means all the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including this year's basketball playoffs, Major League Baseball scores, fights, and yes, the Stanley Cup playoffs for you Rangers fans. Rangers look like they may be on their way to another comeback after a big win last night. And you should know, no matter what you want to bet on, Bet Online is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information, from live betting to playoffs to esports and more. Just head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. Bet Online, where the game starts. This is the Locked On Jets podcast here on this Mailbag Wednesday episode. Our next question, and this is a really interesting question. If we operate under the optimistic assumption that Zach Wilson and the offense will continue to improve, it won't be long before Mike LaFleur starts getting considered for head coaching vacancies. Has Robert Sala implemented the system that will create a continuing pipeline of coaches that can easily slide in as replacements as other teams poach from the staff? It would be nice if Salah had the type of stability in the coaching staff that it appears Joe Douglas has in the scouting department, since we are starting to see some of his scouts get poached as well. That is a great question. That is that is such a good question. I don't have an answer for you, though, because we're so early in the process. But I think that's really important. I think teams don't I think there are a lot of teams that don't think enough about it, that you have to you're going to have to replace guys. And, you know, one of the reasons I think – it's not the top reason. Tom Brady's the top reason. But one of the reasons New England's been so great through the years is how seamlessly they've been able to replace coaches. And this is one of those things I think Belichick – I've read about this. Belichick, like, kind of realized early that when the team was successful, he was going to lose some of his assistants. Essentially, like, what New England – New England doesn't run, like, a, a coordinator system. They run Belichick system. So you have the Belichick offense and you have the Belichick defense. And essentially, if you're hired as a coordinator in New England – you're running Belichick's playbook. You are you're the person in charge of implementing Belichick's playbook, and it makes these things much easier to weather when you when you lose somebody because it's, you essentially just have somebody who's new. You essentially have a new facilitator instead of a new system. You're not, and that's one of those things that helps the team because they don't have to spend the full off season learning a system. You're and you're always refining. You're if you're running the same system for twenty years plus, then you're ref, you're essentially refining things. You don't have to. You're not starting from scratch ever again. So, I hope Salah is. Because you know, sometimes you do see it happen, and I think it's—I do think it's completely overstated the impact of a coordinator leaving. But it can help smooth things over if you just decide that you know what, this is our system. We're going to—you, know, your coordinator is going to implement it. We're going to not going to change playbooks. So you would hope that they are. It's one of the again. It's one of those things that you you don't think about that much. I mean, when uh, Bill Parcells was coaching. The, he got Todd Bowles into co- he he helped get Todd Bowles into coaching because he realized what his, when he, he used to play Todd Bowles, uh, Bowles played with Washington and Parcells was coaching the Giants and Parcells has talked about how he realized Todd Bowles was a really smart player, and uh, that you know and the, that was one of the things that led him to get Bowl, help get Bowles into coaching. So it's one of those things you should always be like you should always have a mindset for what comes next for every for, you should keep your eyes out for players who you think could turn into good coaches. And you should always be trying to train people for the next job. And that's one of the things, you know, Joe Douglas comes from Baltimore. Baltimore has a pipe, steady pipeline where they constantly hiring guys in their 20s, giving them entry-level roles and, and, and kind of get, letting them know, training them in the way, in the Baltimore method. So that when somebody, when you lose your director of college scouting, you have a scout ready to step in. And when that scout, when that scout gets promoted, you have one of these entry-level guys who can step into a scouting role. And I think it's important to create a pipeline with like that. It's a, it's important as far as building a culture goes. I don't know if you can do it within a year. I mean, I think it's one of those things that takes a couple of years to get going. And it takes a couple of years. It'll take a couple of years, ideally. And this is, you know, aspirationally, if Michael LaFleur turns into head coaching material, a guy who gets interviews around the league, you hope that the Jets are training the next guy, though, to come up and take LaFleur's role and succeed in that role. And that's something you see the good organizations do. You don't hear about it a lot, but it is absolutely something one of the, something the great organizations do. I don't know whether the Jets are doing it yet. I hope they are. Anyway, that's all for today's episode. This has been the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. As always, if you enjoyed the show, subscribe to it. Leave the show a five-star review if you're listening on a podcast source or a big thumbs up if you're watching on YouTube. 
Have a great Wednesday, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow to talk more Jets.